Greenpeace. That name first hit the headlines five years ago when they sailed their small boat, the Greenpeace One, into the fallout area of an upcoming American nuclear blast. Now, every night on the news for a week, we've heard of their plan to spray the seals green. To cynical survivors of the 60s, it may seem surprising that there's any idealism left around, and perhaps our curiosity can be pardoned. Are the Greenpeace people superannuated hippies? Are they misguided liberal intellectuals or publicity-prone protesters? Or are they latter-day heroes? I spent some time with them in the past few weeks in Vancouver and Newfoundland. It's the blackest mark on, on the whole Canadian national identity. I mean, people all over the world know about Canada's seal slaughter. Paul Watson, freelance writer, ex-sailor, a longtime dedicated member of the Greenpeace Foundation. He and his companions are in bizarre rehearsal for their next grand adventure. Here on top of a mountain outside Vancouver, I watched them spraying green dye on the snow. Their hearts were light, though their purpose was serious. Their plan at this time was that within a month, they would be out on the ice floes off the Labrador coast, spraying crosses on young harp seals so that their skins become commercially valueless. Their plan has changed. Now they won't use the green dye, but the Greenpeacers will still protect the seals. They will put their own bodies between the seals and the clubs of the sealers. Bob Hunter, president of the Greenpeace Foundation. And, you know, it comes down to a simple thing. If they're going to get the seals, they're going to have to come in over us. And what if they do come in over you? What if they do club you? What will you do? Everybody's been instructed uh, that it's a, a non-violent uh, organization and uh, everyone has instructions not to fight back. So if you're hit, you'll just lie down? They'll be as helpless as the seals. The Save the Seal campaign is the sixth major expedition of the Greenpeace Foundation. Two weeks ago, I visited their busy walk-up office on 4th Avenue in Vancouver. The office looks like a health food store. Lots of plants, posters on the walls, bookshelves and partitions of unfinished lumber. Clothes are casual, no business suits or ties, except that the people here are tied together by a common alarm about what technology is doing to the planet. I knew I had to do something. You know, I couldn't just sit down, work at my job and pretend that it wasn't going on, that we weren't killing all the animals off and that we weren't polluting our earth and that our consciousness was at the level of money and that's it. And so it's really, there was no choice. The Greenpeace Foundation is a registered non-profit society. Most of their money comes from people who share their worry about the environment. The rest comes from selling buttons and t-shirts, from raffles and from benefits. In 1971, their costs were $20,000. In 1975, their costs were $175,000, which they are still paying off. Most of the Greenpeace people work for nothing. Only eight of them are paid, and then only a subsistence wage. The others live by taking part-time jobs and by simplifying their needs. Their president reduced his expenses by living on his weather-beaten boat, a journalist who quit an $18,000 a year job to give all his time to help save the environment. He was on the very first Greenpeace voyage. Back in 1970, the United States Atomic Energy Commission were conducting underground tests on Amchitka Island, about 2,400 miles off the coast of British Columbia. People demonstrated. A small group of environmentalists prepared to fight the might of the U.S. military. They came up with a plan to sail a ship directly into the test zone. They took a year to find a ship owner who would risk himself and his vessel. Finally, they found Captain Cormack, a fisherman with an 80-foot halibut boat. What did you think of all these, this group of people with their long hair and their, uh, their different attitudes to you? I mean, they're very different from you, aren't they? You can't just judge people because they've got long hair, because I keep mine short. On September 15, 1971, Captain Cormack's ship, renamed Greenpeace for the voyage, set sail. The voyage captured people's imagination. David going out to fight giants. The voyage lasted 42 days. The U.S. delayed the test, the Greenpeace ran out of supplies, and it had to put into a U.S. port on the Aleutian Islands. There, the U.S. Coast Guard promptly arrested them on a technicality. And at that point, the crew fragmented, and, and there were those who felt we'd accomplished our purpose, which was, you know, to draw attention to Amchitka. 
And I know when we finally decided to turn around, I was just outraged. I, I thought we'd completely blown it, and we had failed everybody who'd worked so hard to help us out. Back in Vancouver, the committee dashed around and organized a replacement vessel, the 120-foot converted minesweeper, Edgewater Fortune. With 29 volunteers on board and renamed the Greenpeace II, the ship met the woebegone Greenpeace I long enough to take the Greenpeace flag aboard. Then it headed out into the first winter storms on the Gulf of Alaska. It was forced to retreat several times by 70 mile an hour winds. When the bomb finally exploded, the Greenpeace II was still 700 miles from Anchipka. So everyone went home thinking, ah, we've lost it. It's over. And then, uh, you know, a little quiet announcement appeared in the papers in the spring the following year saying that the American Atomic Energy Commission had turned Anchetka Island back into a bird sanctuary. So, it had worked, actually. The next Greenpeace adventure happened in the South Pacific in 1972. David McTaggart, a 44-year-old Canadian living in New Zealand, put his own 38-foot catch under the Greenpeace banner and he, together with his crew, Nigel Ingram, set out to protest against the French nuclear tests on Mururoa Atoll. The French had cordoned off from shipping 100,000 square miles of the high seas. This cordoning off in international waters, that water belongs to you, your children, myself, my grandchildren. They don't have any right to take that water. The French Navy ordered them to leave the area, then threatened them. And finally, the French minesweeper, La Pampolaise, rammed them. Their mizzen mast was broken, and their main mast was driven right into the hull. They were towed to Mororoa for repairs. And the French government said that, uh, that I ran their warship, and that I'd been told to get out, and that I was uh, disrupting the air-sea maneuvers of the French Navy. The next year, 1973, they sailed again. This time, they took two extra crew members with them, two women, Anne-Marie Horn and Mary Lorney. They sailed an amazing 3,000 miles in 21 days. On August 12, 1973, they reached the test zone and hove to. Two days later, an inflatable boat left a French minesweeper and headed towards them. It carried seven men armed with truncheons. Anne-Marie took these photographs and later hid the film in her vagina. When McTaggart tried to block the boarders, the French sailors beat him about the back and neck and knocked him into the inflatable. He lost consciousness as the butt end of a truncheon smashed into his right eye. Drove the eye straight in. My eye, the, the blood just came, came out and, uh, and the eye just clamped closed and I, I remember feeling it and as if there was no eye there. The scheduled nuclear test was carried out. David McTaggart launched lawsuits in the French courts against the French Navy for the ramming. In 1975, he won his case, but the French Navy still haven't paid his damages. He is also suing the French Navy for piracy in the matter of his beating. While David McTaggart was patiently wading through the French court system, the Greenpeace Foundation decided to draw attention to the fact that the great whales of the world are in danger of being hunted to extinction. I didn't even know they were in trouble until uh, about 1971 on, on the first Greenpeace trip. We were going across the Gulf of Alaska and uh, got halfway across and hadn't seen a, a living thing except for the occasional albatross. And the old skipper who'd been out there for 40 years uh, said that he remembered when they used to be wall, uh, horizon to horizon and they'd come up to the boat like big puppies. It took two years to plan, prepare and raise the money for the voyage to save the whales. Again, they hired the fishing boat of Captain Cormac, who had been their captain on the first Greenpeace voyage to Amchitka. Again, they would put their bodies on the line. They would position themselves between the harpoon guns and the whales. The Greenpeacers foresaw a real danger of someone falling into the chilly waters of the Pacific, 
so they tested their equipment in the harbor and developed techniques for getting back quickly into the boat. And we left about April the 27th last year, and uh, it was a marvelous thing. 23,000 people showed up, and there were 17 bands. For the next 62 days, they searched but couldn't find the Russian whaling fleet. 62 days in which close quarters, boredom, and the tension of the waiting sent people chasing their own way to pass the time. You know, there were, there were moments where you'd finally, there was nothing going on, it was all very dreamlike, but uh, mostly it was all tension because we were never sure whether we were going to find the whalers. We were in debt up to our ears, and uh, we had to find them. When did you meet the Russian fleet? It was about June the 20th, I think. It was as if they'd been set up like a movie because we come toodling along and there's the entire Russian whaling fleet with the factory ship and all the chaser boats. Beautiful available light for our cameras, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and bang, a dead whale lying in the water. Now, the first whale we saw, one of the women on board, Carly Truman, suddenly yelled out, my God, it's just a baby. And it was. So the first thing we did was get our camera crew out there with uh, Paul Watson, our, our diver, to try and measure the whale. But to this point, we've been dealing with live whales, and everyone was in love with whales, and here's this slaughtered teenage whale lying in the water, and uh, everybody just got, the emotions just got pretty crazy at that stage. What do you say, Paul? How long do you think it is? How long? About 18 feet. So Watson jumped on it, and uh, as a matter of fact, he closed, the whale's eye was open, so he just pushed the lid and closed, closed its eye. When you say on board, you mean you jumped on the top of a whale. What was that like? Well, it was, uh, it was sad. I mean, there, there was a harpoon lower in the back, and the blood was coming through, so the blood was coming on my hands. And it, it was very recently killed because it was very warm. We measured it, and in fact, it was uh, 26 feet, which is four feet under the legal minimum. And then those of us who were up on the main vessel suddenly looked up and we realized that the Russians had one of the Russian killer boats had turned around and was coming straight towards us. So the first thing we did was yell over to the camera crew and, and Watson to hurry up, get back on, because, uh, I mean, absurdly enough, at that point, we were worried about all our camera equipment being sprayed because the Russians had this big fire hose uh, going on the, on the front of their boat. So it was this ridiculous situation of us being attacked by a, a World War II-type military vessel with a harpoon mounted on the front, except that they were firing a hose. <laughs> So what they started doing the moment we showed up is they started going around scooping up all these whales that had been lying in the water, and they lashed them to the side of the uh, chaser boat. Then they would take the whales over to the factory ship where they'd be, a line would be transferred, and they'd haul them in through a, a hole in the back. So our camera crew went right up and started taking pictures. Were they actually uh, cutting up whales there? Mm -hmm. Non-stop, day after day. The bilge pump on the side has blood pouring out of it, and Underneath the water, there's a constant school of sharks just floating around, nibbling away. How did it smell? Exactly like a slaughterhouse. In fact, uh, almost everybody on, on our boat, when we suddenly came around downwind from it, just about everybody threw up. I guess they thought we were a bunch of Canadians out there making a movie or something like that. They didn't catch on uh, at all until we finally got our rubber boats right in front of their harpoon that there was something wrong. There was a guy running back and forth to the bridge, and I guess they finally got the word from the Kremlin or Vladivostok or wherever they get the word from and uh, decided to go ahead anyway. But they, he, and the guy must have been a good shot is all I can figure out, or else we were awfully lucky, whatever. He, he kind of waited until we, we, we went down on a swell and the whales came up, and then he fired over our head, so it missed us by maybe about six or seven feet. How heavy is the cable? How big is the cable? Well, that cable was the thing we were worried about. It's a big steel cable. And so it came down about just about three feet of the side of our zodiac, like a big, uh, a huge Damoclean sword going into the water. And then the whale starts convulsing, so then we had to get out of there fast before we got sliced into pieces by that. The Russians decided to end the confrontation. They abandoned the pot of whales and they steamed away at a speed which was eight knots faster than Greenpeace could muster. This summer, the Greenpeace people will sail out once again in search of the whalers, but this time they're going to have a faster ship. Right now, here off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador, their project is to save the seals. 
out there in their newborn thousands getting used to the cold world. The scientific name is Pagophilus greenlandicus, which translated means the ice lovers of Greenland. Every year, hundreds of thousands of these harp seals head for their whelping grounds off the coast of Labrador and in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There, on the ice flows, each female will give birth to a single white-coated pup. On average, a pup weighs 15 pounds at birth. In three weeks, on its mother's fat-rich milk, it grows to 100 pounds. Then the mother abandons the pup to fend for itself. The white coat lasts only for the three weeks. Then the pup molts. For more than 200 years, hunters have killed the baby seals for that white fur, usually while the pup is still nursing. The white fur reflects ultraviolet light and based on this, scientists have developed a new way to photograph them from the air. They can now count the white pups on the white ice. For every five pups counted in 1952, only one pup was counted in 1975. It seems clear that the seals are in danger of extinction. Three quarters of the annual kill is made by the Norwegian and Canadian sealing fleets. The remainder are killed by landsmen from Newfoundland and Labrador. Every year, seals grow scarcer. Every year, the quota goes down. This year's quota is 126,000, of which 96,000 goes to the commercial fleets. In all their encounters so far, Greenpeace has played the Canadian David to the foreign Goliaths. The Americans, the Russians, the Japanese, the French all easily identified in the causes of the time as the international bad guys of ecology. But so far, Greenpeace had not confronted their fellow Canadians as an adversary, not, that is, until last week, when 15 people from the Greenpeace movement drove into the town of St. Anthony, Newfoundland, to disrupt the annual seal hunt. From television and newspaper reports, the locals saw the Greenpeacers as mainland radicals, out to stop all the seal hunting, and as a threat not only to their incomes, but to their traditional life and freedoms of the Newfie fishermen. I'm not trying to change your way of life. It will interfere like with our way of life. I don't think so. Is it, if the Many of the Newfoundlanders here wanted to turn the Greenpeacers back and run them out of town, but they offered a compromise in the spirit of Greenpeace itself. They would let the mainlanders into town if they, in turn, would agree to attend a public meeting with all the local residents here in the gymnasium of the local public school. I'd like to place a resolution before this meeting tonight that these people be given until tomorrow morning to place themselves back on their bus, remove themselves from St. Anthony and the province of Newfoundland. Thank you. The Greenpeacers now had their backs to the wall, so they made concessions. They now said that the foreign fleets were their adversaries and not the Canadian landsmen. Bob Hunter was forced to give up their plan to dye the seals green. I've already, I have, I have stated that we did not realize that it would interfere with your livelihood. Now that we understand that, we are prepared not to do it. We are not Although here, here's the here's the die. Um, we spent uh, months digging that stuff up together, so maybe keep it as a souvenir. <laughs> Things started out well this effect. morning as the green well, peasers passed over their, their green dye to the local expect. people. They kept their promise and say they will not spray the baby seals. It was a disappointment handing over the dye and a defeat of sorts. But the Greenpeacers were fundamentally concerned with cementing good relations with the Newfoundlanders. Uh, we'll be moving out onto the ice tomorrow, as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Always pragmatic in their idealism, they compromised and surrendered the green dye and tried to regain lost ground by recruiting local support for their efforts to block the Norwegian fleet. A lady who's on the town council phoned up, Mrs. Walker, and said that anything we can do, she can do to help us let her know, you know, don't worry about the few hotheads, we're with you 100%. Oh, wow. With the Newfoundlanders apparently now on their side, Greenpeace had only to cope with a more familiar adversary, the Canadian government. 
On March 2nd, the federal government passed an amendment to the Fisheries Act in what seemed unusual haste and with terribly convenient timing. It was made public only on March the 5th, just five days before Greenpeace had planned their first excursion to the ice flows. And section 21, subsection B, says that no one shall tag or mark or attempt to tag or mark a live seal in any manner. Do you feel that that regulation was aimed towards you, the Greenpeace people? Well, there was no doubt about it because there's no one, no one else uh, had uh, expressed any intention to go out and spray seals. So when they suddenly invented a law to spray against spraying seals, we, we pretty well reasonably assumed that uh, quite apart from it being a manifestation of Castroism, that it was a, a, a gesture aimed directly against us. And on top of a secret new law, the Department of Fisheries resorted to harassment of the Greenpeacers. On March 10th, the two helicopters chartered by the group were as idle as the boats in the harbor. The reason? Greenpeace was unable to purchase fuel anywhere in St. Anthony because dealers like Tony Smith had been advised by officers of the Department of Fisheries that the government would take a dim view of anyone selling fuel to Greenpeace. And what did they say? Well, it was such that they would suggest that I would not sell any fuel and if I did, that I could be taken out for an accessory. No, we just wanted to bring something to your attention that occurred here today. The Greenpeacers were so outraged, they called in the RCMP and laid a complaint of extortion against the Department of Fisheries. If you're making an official complaint, sir, yes. we will follow the regular investigative procedures. At that, the Department of Fisheries backed off, and Greenpeace proceeded with its next plan to fly out to the ice flows and confront the Norwegian sealing fleet. We'll be standing in front of the vessels as they come through the ice, and we'll also be covering the, the white coats' bodies with our own when the, when the sealers approach them. Are you willing to die for a seal? If I die for a seal, I'd die for a seal, but I, I don't think I'm going to have to die for a seal. I don't think it will come to that. I don't think the Norwegians will kill me in order to get a, a baby seal. And hopefully the, the message of it will be the fact that we are willing to do this. Despite all their problems, the Greenpeace people are heading out towards the ice flows. The Norwegian ships are heading across the Atlantic, the Canadian ships heading up the coast, all bound for the harp seal herd. The time is almost here when the Greenpeace people will place their bodies between the bodies of the seals and the clubs of the sealers. That confrontation will take place about a hundred miles out there 